I'm so glad that each of you are here this morning to celebrate the one who brings us life. I'm so glad you're here. He is risen. He is risen. In early 2006, it was San Francisco paralegal Mike Patterson. He started a website that was called MyDeathSpace.com. It was an internet site that detailed the deaths of MySpace members, and, and it offered links to archived pages of their accounts. There was even a digital uh, map of the track that kept. There was a digital map that kept track of the locations of all the deceased who were registered. Patterson's site uh, lists nearly 3,000 deaths, and there are a thousand hits a day on that site. Over time, mydeathspace.com has become sort of a virtual uh, graveyard without tombstones, without flowers, mostly for young people who have passed away or something's happened in their life and they've, they've died. Though some use this site to mourn or heal or maybe to discuss matters of the afterlife, critics say that most people go to the site out of morbid curiosity. Bob Thompson, who is a professor at Syracuse University, uh, he is a professor of popular culture. He said this. He said, this site does kind of let you look into the heart of darkness. He says, we see those kind of things that we try not to think about, which is how we are all dancing on the edge, how quickly mortality can come in and take us. Have you ever noticed how our culture, the culture that we live in, do you know that they're obsessed with death? And dying? I don't know if you know that. I mean, pay attention to the latest movies, books, even uh, television or television shows or movies that are out there, books. You'll see an unhealthy preoccupation with the subject of death. And yet, the Christian focus, in the Christian faith, our focus this morning, friends, is not death. Our focus this morning is life, life for today. Life for the, that, that is yet to be lived when you and I experience resurrection. Today we want to set our sights specifically on the resurrection of Jesus and why. Why his resurrection was and is necessary for you and me. The fact is that if the resurrection of Jesus had not taken place, we would also find ourselves this morning focusing on death rather than life. So I want to consider three reasons why Jesus' resurrection was necessary on this Easter Sunday. You have sermon notes that are in your worship folder. If you'd like to use them, go right ahead. There's pencils in front of you. Uh, you may, I may ask you to underline or circle some words uh, or write some other scripture on there. But you use that if you want. If not, just place it to the side. The first reason why Jesus' resurrection was necessary was to fulfill scripture. You saw that on the screen. It was to fulfill Scripture. Jesus promised in Scripture that after he gave his life and sacrifice, he promised, I will rise again. Uh, in Luke 24, verses 44 through 46, this is what he said. This is what Jesus said. He said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me by Moses... And, and the prophets and in the Psalms must come true. I want you to circle those three words. Moses, prophets, and the Psalms. Because all three of them were written at different times. They were all written about Jesus and what was going to happen. Then he opened their minds to understand these scriptures. And he said, yes, underline these next few words. It was written a long time ago. That the Messiah suffer and die and rise again from the dead on the third day. Now that's an absolutely amazing promise, isn't it? Jesus made an incredible promise. Now could you imagine if someone would make that claim today? What if they made that claim in our environment today? What if your best friend came up to you and said, I'm about to die. And I promise you that in three days, I'm going to come back from the dead. 
Well, you would. What would you think of that person? Would you believe them if they said it? Would you think, da 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 da? You know, they're a little off. You know, most of us would think exactly that. Kind of, what's going on here? I would venture to guess that you would think that that person either is a fool or they're mentally unstable, especially three days after their death when no resurrection had occurred. Now, what if that were to happen to Jesus' promise? What if Jesus' promise had not come true? Well, see, we can give a lot of answers to that question, but the one that comes to our mind, first of all, is that if Jesus did not really rise from the dead, then the scriptures would be invalidated. In other words, you couldn't trust one word in here. It'd be untrustworthy if Jesus had not resurrected from the dead. We couldn't believe what the Bible says about the resurrection. By the way, the resurrection is the most foundational truth in all of Christianity. How could we believe anything else if this would not have happened? Look at John chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. All right, Jesus replied. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it up. What? They exclaimed. It took 46 years to build this temple, and you can do it in three days? But by this temple, but by this temple, Jesus meant his body. And you saw that on the screen here just earlier. And after he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed both Jesus and the scriptures. Now I want you to notice something that's very important in verse 22. It's the last verse. Uh, following Jesus' resurrection, the disciples believed both Jesus and, the, and the, the scriptures. I want you to underline they believed. They not only believed in circle Jesus and scriptures. They both believed in both of those. The, little, the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ was foundational to the disciples' faith, both in Christ and in the Bible. And you know what? The same is true for you and I today. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, the truth of the scripture is validated, if, did, if Jesus did. But if Jesus did not rise from the dead, uh, we would, it would all appear foolish. I want you to notice um, this quote. It's from Wolfhart Cannonburg. He said this. He said, The evidence of Jesus' resurrection is so strong that nobody would question it except for two things. First, it is a very unusual event. And second, if you believe it happened, you have to change the way you live. End quote. Thank God that you and I can rely on the Word of God. It is verified through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the first one was to fulfill the scriptures that were written a long time ago about Him. Here's the second one. The second reason why Jesus' resurrection was necessary was to forgive us our sins and to make us right with God. To forgive our sins. Make us right with God. Let me share a few scriptures with you. They're in your sermon notes and on the screen. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 16 and 17 says this. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. And you are still under condemnation for your sins. I want you to underline, you are still under condemnation for your sins. That's if it didn't happen. And then there's Romans 4.25. that says Jesus was handed over to die. You want to know why Jesus died? Underlying these next four words. Because of our sin. He paid our price. And, and it says he was raised from the dead to make us right with God. Underline that. To make us right with God. And then there's Romans 8.34. It says this. Who then will condemn us? Will Christ Jesus? No. For he is the one who died for us, and he was raised to life for us, and he's sitting at the place of highest honor next to God, and he's pleading for us. He's interceding for us. I want you to underline, he's the one who died for us, he died in our place, and he was raised to life for us. All right? The resurrection of Jesus Christ was necessary to finish the work that had happened on the cross. 
without the resurrection of Jesus uh, from the dead, the cross becomes meaningless. In fact, we're told, as we just read these verses, in the Bible, that if Jesus had not risen from the dead, my faith, your faith, would be useless. And we're still under condemnation. But thanks be to God that he fulfilled his promise and he rose from the dead three days later after he went to the cross. Paul tells us that because of this promise, because it was fulfilled, that you and I have been made right with God. All of our sins have been forgiven. And all of us have, all of those who place their faith in Jesus Christ, their trust in Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior, we have the promise of eternity. Let's say I'm over here. And I'm on a two by two platform. And there's nothing down there. I mean, it's, it goes forever. Here I am. I'm a man. It's you. There's death. I face death. I'm a sinner. Over here is another platform. And on this two foot two platform is God, who's holy and perfect and just. And he's God. But I'm over there. And there's no way to get across here. And God knew that. I want to make it right with you, with man, because of your sin. I don't want you to die a death anymore and be separated from me. So he gave Jesus. And so you have the work of the cross that expands across these two platforms. And by faith, Jesus says, come to me. And by faith, I need to say, I accept what you did on the cross for me. And I'm by faith, you know, kind of like the... Uh, you remember seeing uh, Indiana Jones? He walks that cliff, he had to take the first step, and all of a sudden that thing goes across the, the big valley, and he walks across to the other side. That's what you have to do. You have to take a step of faith to God to believe in what he did, and here's God. And we can have a right relationship because of what Jesus did on the cross. See, do you understand today that it is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that you and I can stand before God completely innocent, that none of our sins will be held up against us. Do you understand that it's because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that you can live the rest of your life free of all and any condemnation? Do you understand today that it's because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that you can face freedom, your future has freedom in it, instead of cowering in fear? There's an Old Testament story that was kind of a foreshadowing for what Jesus went through. It was, it was, um, my mind just went back. I look at my notes. I'm not, Moses. Uh, it, was, it was Moses. Moses was with the Israelites and they were complaining to God and God was frustrated with them so he sent them a bunch of snakes. And some of these snakes bite and they were poisonous and people were dying. It was a, God was angry with them. You guys are complaining, he just sent these snakes. Now, I don't like snakes at all. Not at all, I only like to see them. But these, these people were dying, and they came to Moses and says, we're dying. We need help, we're being bitten, and people are dying. So he goes to God and says, what should I do? And God told Moses to build like a cross and put a bronze snake on it. And all he said was, all they have to do is look at it, you hold it up, and look, let people look at it. And if they look at it, they'll live. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3.14, you can write that on your notes and look it up later, but John 3.14, Jesus, Jesus referred to this, just as Moses was lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. That was a foreshadowing of what is to come. Jesus, his resurrection was a necessity because through his resurrection, you and I are made completely whole before God. That's the second reason. He came to forgive my sin and to forgive me and to make me right with God. He made you and I right with God. That's what he did. Here's the third thing. The third reason why Jesus' resurrection was necessary was to give us a hope to give us hope for the future. Give us hope for the future. There are some people 
they were out hanging around some friends. They were hanging out one day, and, and the conversation grimly turned to the issue of death. One of the friends asked uh, these other friends, he says, what would you like people to say about you at your funeral? So one of the friends says, well, I would want people to say I was a good humanitarian person. I cared about my community. Another person says, well, I would like people to say that he was a great father, a great husband, and was a great example to follow. Third person thought about it a little bit, said, well, I kind of hope that someone says, look, he's moving. <laughs> That's a great answer. But it's unnecessary for the Christian because in Jesus Christ, friends, we have no fear of death. Because death is simply a transition into eternal life. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 16 through 20, follow along. It says, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. And you're still under condemnation for your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ have perished. And if we have hope in Christ only in this life, we're the most miserable people in the world. But the fact is that Christ has been raised from the dead. It's a fact. He's become the first of a great harvest of those who will be raised to life again. Notice that Paul is not saying, uh, what, notice what Paul is saying here. He's not, not only is the resurrection of Jesus an historical fact, but that Jesus is, is only the first of a great harvest of those who will rise again to life. If you're going to underline a couple verses there, underline the last two sentences, because it says the fact is Christ has been raised, underline that, and he's become the first of a great harvest of those who will be raised again to life. In other words, all who place their trust in Jesus Christ are promised that they too will rise from the dead. You remember the story of Lazarus? Lazarus was good friends with Jesus and Jesus was talking to Martha, who was Lazarus' sister. And this is what Jesus told her, John 11, uh, verses 25 through 27. Jesus told her, because Lazarus had died, I am the resurrection and the life. I want you to underline this next phrase, or the, the whole verse. It says, those who believe in me, even though they die like everyone else, will, circle will, they will live again. And underline the next sentence. They are given eternal life for believing in me. And, sort of the next word, will never perish. And then he asked Martha, Martha, do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she said. I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. See, Martha's, Martha's brother had died, and she was going through a very hard time. It's the process of grief. Her feelings of sorrow the day that she encountered Jesus are the same feelings that countless people encounter and have fell down through the ages whenever we've lost a loved one. It's the hardest thing to deal with and to go through. And many of you could empathize with Martha that day. See, death seems so final, so complete, and so overwhelming that sometimes you think you're wondering if you'll ever recover. But Jesus gave Martha hope through the revelation that not only did he have the power to resurrect, but he says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. And not only that, but for all who believe in Jesus, you're given eternal life and you will never perish. Now, if you remember the rest of the story of Lazarus, that's one, that's where you, if you want to remember a, memorize a verse today, Jesus wept. He wept because he loved Lazarus. He saw the people weeping. He was four days late. Lazarus had been dead for four days. And he goes up and he says, Lazarus, come out. And out walks Lazarus. He said, take those grave clothes off. He rose up from the dead. I'm going to show you I'm the resurrection life. Lazarus, come forth. This same hope is offered to all who place their trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. See, the resurrected life comes to us all. Our Christian loved ones who have preceded us in death have preceded us in life. They now experience what we still hope for. And from this truth, we derive the strength to look longingly toward the future. There was a funeral 
And it was a, a Pastor Bob Russell. His father had died on a cold, blustery day in Pennsylvania. The roads were so bad that they could not uh, go, the cars couldn't go to the cemetery after the service. So the funeral director came up and told Bob, he says, I'll take care of the body later. I'll take it to the grave. But Bob couldn't bear the fire. So he, his brother, and their sons piled into a four-wheel drive SUV, and they followed the hearse to the cemetery. In his own words, this is what he says. Russell says, we plowed through 10 inches of snow into the cemetery. Got about 50 yards from my dad's grave with the wind blowing about 25 miles an hour. And the six of us lugged the casket down to the gravesite. He says, we watched the body lowered into the grave and we turned to leave. And he says, I felt like something was undone. And he said, I'd like for us to have a prayer together. The six of us huddled together and I prayed. Lord, this is such a cold, lonely place. And he says, I got too choked up to pray anymore. And I kept battling for my composure, and finally I just whispered, But I thank you, for we know to be absent from the body is to be safe in your warm arms. Friends, that's the hope that we have today. Not a hope that might be, but a hope that certainly will be. Our own resurrection from the dead. On this Easter Sunday, there's a lot of places that you can, could have been today. But I thank you that you were here today to learn of the necessity of Christ's resurrection. Because without that historical fact, then our lives become meaningless. Praise God for the victory that we have today because Jesus, Jesus Christ, conquered the grave. Scripture has been fulfilled. Our sins have been paid for. There's no condemnation. And we have a certain hope for our future. As we, I want you to sing this. Uh, you're welcome to sing it. Let the words minister to you. But stay seated. It's a song that says, Worthy is the Lamb. I want to finish that way. The Lamb of God is worthy of praise. And it also has a song, Crowning with Many Crowns. He is worthy of praise and celebration. Let's listen. And, and if, you want, if you know the song, sing along with it.
incredible deal. It's the greatest deal. If you've never accepted Christ into your life, or you're going to leave this place and not know that you have hope that if you were to face death, I want you to have hope. I want you to know without a doubt that you have a hope of heaven. And if you've never accepted Christ, I just want to invite you to come out right where you're at and make a decision. Say, I want to follow you today. I want you to be my Lord and say, if that's you and you've never done that before, we want to celebrate with you on that choice of an act of your will to say, I want to choose to follow Jesus. And if that's you this morning, just step out right now and come and join me. We're going to celebrate. Anybody? Step out right where you're at. Let me say this. I know what's when you're in front of people. Feel free to call me. Say, man, I'm going to talk. 